that's all I can say. <laughs> uh, let me just switch um, the technique and uh, we will be starting in a minute. Uh, can you take that off? Yeah. This is yours. Don't lose it. All right. All right, so it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here. I just don't know why the color is not. Can you just double check? Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It's a great pleasure to be here because I think the cardiometabolic issue is the major one. And um, before we start, I just want to ask you, um, what is your specialty? So who is a cardiologist? Hands up. Okay, very few. Who is an endocrinologist? Oh, quite a few. Who is a family doctor? General, who is an internist? What are the others? Nephrologists? Gynecologists, okay, good. So I think we have a good uh, bunch of people, different specialties, and we're gonna talk about um, a practical approach of type two diabetes management. And before we start, let me just add on. Um, for years, I've been the speaker of the working group Diabetes and the Heart of the German Diabetes Association. I'm an um, endocrinologist, but I'm a hypertensiologist, I'm a nutrition specialist and um, have a keen interest in the cardiometabolic field for years. And as a member and actually as a speaker of the working group Diabetes and the Heart, I was condemned <laughs> to join the guideline committees. I say condemned because you know that's a lot of work. So if you are in a guideline committee, what you need to do is you get more than 1,000 abstracts about diabetes, complications, interventions, and so on. And you have to read all that. Once you have sorted it out and you said, this is good, this is bad, I didn't know, the good ones, you get the original papers. And you have to read the original papers from the beginning to the very end. And you have to make sure that the methodology is okay, that all the data have been presented, that all the data have been appropriately discussed, and that the conclusion is okay. So when you go through that, it takes another couple of months till you then get together with the other members of the guideline committee to decide which of the papers are worthwhile to be put in the guidelines. It takes five years. So. Being a member at the beginning, I was really, really mad because you do this besides of all your work, you are not being paid, and um, I hated methodology. But in the meantime, I'm so grateful that I had to do this, uh, and I had joined a couple of other guideline committees, and I'm just having the next guideline committee meeting Monday next week, once I'm back in Germany, um, and it changed my mind. Because there are so many things we do on a daily basis, because we think it's logical or we think everyone does it, so we have to do it. Because we have been always doing it, we think this is the right thing. But sometimes in the light of evidence-based medicine, you are shocked. And when I was sitting together with the cardiologist, the nephrologist and all that stuff, the cardiologists in the early stages, they started to look at me and said, poor guy, you're a diabetologist. How can you contribute that your people live longer? How can you really make sure that they don't die of a heart attack? And at the very beginning, we had very few data. 
And just before I was about to get depressed, <laughs> why not? <laughs> um, we got the great data. And I want to share with you the development of, well, I would say a paradigm shift which happened in the last 10 to 15 years. So these are my disclosures. You see there are quite a few companies with cardiometabolic issues. Um, and let's move on. Right? What do I address? What is the main problem in type 2 diabetes? And I'm talking about type 2 diabetes. What did we achieve in the past? And where are we now? And where could and where should we be? So let's have a look here. If you are 60 years old and if you don't have diabetes, statistically you have another 24 years to live. But if you have diabetes, you have lost six years just by the diagnosis diabetes. And if you have diabetes and if you had had a heart attack, you have lost 11 to 12 years. This is bad news. And when I talk to my patient and I say, listen, you're too obese, your glucose is not controlled, your blood pressure is not controlled, your lipids are not controlled, you're going to have more complications. You, we thought, we've got to do something now. He says, eh, it doesn't hurt, so why should I change? You know this? So, what I started to say to my patients, bad news, good news, the bad news are here, the good news are, if you want to see your grandchildren grow up, we've got to start doing something right now. So why is diabetes increasing? And I tell you, I have been traveling throughout the world. I, two years ago, I toured through Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, Egypt, uh, not Egypt, uh, Ethiopia, and all these countries. And over there, diabetes is explosion, uh, exploding. It's not because the genes have changed, but it's because the environment has changed. And look at that, while these TVs almost cannot get any slimmer anymore, we have plenty of room for enlargement. And you all know that with this abdominal waste, a host of cardiometabolic risk factors pop up, which every single of these risk factors is an established risk factor for the same end organ. And this is why, for us clinicians, the concept of the metabolic syndrome is so important. In Germany, we still have too many doctors who have the silo thinking. Blood pressure, oh, it's a bit elevated, so watch it. Lipids, a bit elevated, watch it. And they don't see the connection, because if you have dyslipidemia, if you have hypertension and the belly, <laughs> you better check whether the guy has no diabetes yet. So, a couple of years ago, we had quite good news from the States to say that compared to people without diabetes, there is a slight drop in heart attack and stroke. There was a major success in reducing stroke and MI in people with diabetes, but this was not the better glycemic control. It was the early intervention, PTCA, it was statins, it was hypertensive treatment, and, you know, this was very, very successful. But, look at that. You still see that the order here is much, much higher compared to the general population. The bad news comes now. While this is still the case that you have a drop in the aged population, it slowed down and is on a level, it leveled off in the middle-aged population, and look at that, it starts to increase in the younger population with type 2 diabetes. And we need to know that in the States already, this paper 2017 stated that 50% of the kids diagnosed with hyperglycemia have type 2 diabetes, not type 1 diabetes. And when you look at these 21-year-old kids and you compare the type 1 diabetic subject with the type 2 diabetic subject, you very quickly see that those with type 2 diabetes have a much higher rate of kidney disease. 20% at the age of 21 already had kidney disease, 10% retinopathy, 20% neuropathy, 
and 50% had arterial stiffness. So hypertension was found in 22% of the kids. Kids which usually don't even see a doctor because they are only obese. And when you compare the type 1 and the type 2 in all these comorbidities, we must say, hey, those with type 1 diabetes certainly have much more hyperglycemia, hypoglycemia and all that stuff. But yet they have much lower rates of events. Why? Because it's a different disease. It's a different, not only phenotype, it's a totally different pathophysiology. And in particular in Asia, diabetes is exploding because of the one-child uh, uh, politics, in, uh, for instance, in China. Because four grandparents need to feed one child. <laughs> and that's why you have a lot of obesity over there. But it comes worse. This is a prospective study in the States where they look at type 1 and type 2 diabetic young adults and they follow them over the years. The first thing is just to prove that type 2 diabetes is, has overtaken type 1 diabetes in growth and it's growing in a much steeper rate. In that study, they prospectively check the kids every year and look at that, what they do. They check the eyes, they check for retinopathy, hemorrhage and all these things. They check for kidney, for neuropathy, for cardiac and everything. And when you look at the New England Journal paper where they published the first results of these kids aged 26 now, you see that type 1 and type 2 diabetes, type 2 in red, show a lot of complications, in particular in the people with type 2 diabetes. Look at that, 60% almost have already microvascular disease. And when it comes to microvascular disease, you see a similar picture, it's only a third. 26-year-old young people having already all these complications. Isn't that awful? It's very much worrisome because the new concept, which we also discussed on all the meetings, is the years lived with all these risk factors. Because even if they are controlled, we don't even know what's happening. And it takes a long time for these risk factors to be detected and then really controlled. So the troublemakers are here, all over the world. It's called diabetes. It's obesity and then diabetes. So when we look what we achieved in the past, we have to reflect upon a little bit what we did. So it was right that very early on in epidemiology, we started to look out what is the business with elevated glucose. So diabetes is defined by a, a increased glucose, and we can measure that on an epidemiological base easily. We don't need to be fasted. We just get HbA1c. So when you plot that to all these complications, you see that there is a clear cut, and now I name the word, association. It's not causal, it's an association between HbA1c and all these different comorbidities. And when we go on and look at the UK PDS trial, which you probably have already seen this uh, graph, you see that if you plot the mean updated HbA1c over these eight years, and you look at the rates of complications over here, you see this is a straight line. The higher the HbA1c and the higher the rates of complication. The lower the HbA1c, the lower the rates of complication. Hey, we thought, easy, <laughs> let's just get HbA1c down and everything will be cool. And we reduced diabetes management just to the management of one lab value. Thinking that if we revert epidemiology, everything will be okay. So this strategy is a little bit outdated as this chap here hopefully. <laughs> um, and we have kind of taught our patients 
also the thing to observe HbA1c as the main important marker for the self-management. So let me now be mean. What is the evidence? And if you look in the evidence-based data, it's a bit shocking. Look at that. These are the only five, four trials we have to look at the strategy is bashing HbA1c doing the job. UK PDS was important, but nowadays every cardiologist and nephrologist would say we cannot accept that anymore because at that time, 40 years ago, we didn't have statins, we didn't have uh, ACE inhibitors and sartans. So that's why advanced VADT and Accord are much better to look at. And you see here, this is the intervention they had the best control. And these guys here were in the control group. And when you look at that, there is one study which was really shocking to me. This is the VADT trial because it has a maximum HbA1c difference of 1.5 milligrams. This group was condemned to have a HbA1c of 8.4 over seven years. And you could achieve an HbA1c of 6.9. We were not allowed to do a study like that in Germany, in Europe, because we, at that time, thought it's unethical because these people with 8.4 will die. The study was never interrupted. And after seven years, guess what? No difference. I think this is quite shocking. And I tell you what, these bad news are never b discussed at the conferences. And that's bad news as well. <laughs> Because we need to also look into the negative data. So anyways, all these data here, and if you add on the proactive trial with uh, um, pioglitazone, ended up showing that there is no reduction in mortality. And up to that time, I kept telling my patient, hey, your metabolic control is lousy, you're going to die earlier. But indirectly, I did say, when you have a good glycemic control, you live forever. There's no data. At least with the strategies which we had at that time. So let's have a look. How can we explain that? Well, one of the things is, and as we discussed shortly, is the clinical inertia. The next thing is, that might be the wrong strategy. Is HbA1c the good and the only target? Maybe the side effects of the drugs which we had been using wiped off the benefits of the better control. Maybe the old strategies were ineffective. Or maybe because we were so focused on sugar, we forgot all about hypertension and, and lipids and so on. So we were sugarologists. So let's have a look here. Is HbA1c a good marker? And I just bring one picture of a patient of mine with a CGM. And you see this patient, it's all in German, had an HbA1c of 6.7. And you would say, hey, great, well controlled. But look at that. This guy had 33 severe hypoglycemia here. And he spent a lot of time in hypoglycemia. So the hypoglycemia kind of wiped off the high glucose values and it ended up with the same HbA1c. So one thing in the future we will be looking at is as we call the time in range to make sure that we stay out of hypoglycemia and of course try to stay off the hyperglycemia. But as you know, in all these trials, we were just looking at HbA1c. The next thing is inertia. And these are data from Great Britain. And they would hold true for Germany and probably your countries as well. If the people are on one OAD, oral uh, antidiabetic agent, the HbA1c at change of uh, strategy was 8.7. If you were on two, the HbA1c was 9.1. 
And if you were on three OADs, guess what? The HbA one c was 9.7. So we are always too late. So what we have been doing in the past is a reactive treatment because we looked at HbA1c, if it was high, we said, oh, we've got to do something. And then HbA1c started to drop and said, yes, we are good. <laughs> and we can wait. And we waited till it went up. And then you've got to do something. And we waited. And it's only when it went all the way up that we said, who cares, we've got to do something. So the way we treated was basically a reactive treatment approach. And we were not actively controlling glycemia. So when we look at the patients and the data which we have on monotherapy, we know that over the years, more and more of the patients fail to be able to control glycemia with just one oral agent. So that's why we need to combine early. And if we were able to do so and start an intensified treatment earlier, we would end up having a much better control over time. And the Verify study, which was published about four years ago, they did show if you start out with an early combination therapy, you are much better able to maintain a good glycemic control. And indeed, beta cell function seems to have a much better survival and a better control later on as well. So, there's another thing, which you probably also know from your uh, daily work. If we want to achieve good glycemic control, I myself find myself um, in face of the problem that intensified glycemic control can cause weight gain, and it can cause hypoglycemia. And frequently, I have a patient, I say, listen, the main aim for this guy is to lose weight. So if I risk hypoglycemia and weight gain, I don't know whether I do something good. And in particular, people who have hypoglycemia, they don't tell you hypoglycemia because they think it's their fault. So what do they do? They have defensive snacking. And the defensive snacking, of course, extra calories will lead to weight gain and a worsening of cardiometabolic risk factors. And I must say that I found out that many, many, many of my patients do this, but they don't dare to tell you because they think it's their fault. So I call this the Bermuda Triangle for the doctors and the patient to achieve good glycemic control without these side effects. And what does the patient want to have? Well, the patients, they want to have a simple therapy, they want to have no side effects, and basically no need for a specific diet. They don't want the sticky stuff, they don't want weight gain and hypoglycemia, but they want less complications, and they want to live a normal life. And honestly, we sometimes forget that. And honestly, we didn't talk about the cost, so that's another issue, but honestly, 98% of the time in their lives, the patients are not with us. So we are not controlling what they do. And we have to keep that in mind as well. But there's also another issue. Is it only hyperglycemia? And we are starting to understand more and more that this, what we have learned, is not basically true the way we thought. We know that people with diabetes die of cardiovascular disease and we had thought, thought that only at the time of diagnosis of hyperglycemia the risk for microvascular disease starts to grow. We did acknowledge already that many of our patients when they are diagnosed to be diabetic they already have heart attack and a stroke. I was chairing a big center of inpatient rehabilitation uh, of patients with heart attacks, coronary bypass crisis, and all that. And every day we discovered diabetes in these patients, in some of the patients. Why? Because they are the high risk group. But let's step back. If this is the case, if diabetes is diagnosed only when atherosclerosis events happened, the atherosclerotic process must have happened in the pre-diabetic phase with glycemia not playing the only role. 
There are major roles for obesity, inactivity, smoking, bad diets, hypertension and dyslipidemia. And just to make sure that this is really the case, I was so happy to find this paper. This is from Great Britain. What they did, they had a group, a large group of patients, I don't know how many, but let's say about 2,000, who were followed as pre-diabetic patients and they had a check every year. And when they now had developed full-blown diabetes, they now checked the complications. And guess what? At the time of diagnosis, 42% of the people already had microvascular disease. And 30% already had macrovascular disease. So this cannot be just caused by hyperglycemia. So if we want to reduce cardiorenal complications, we need to do more than just glucose control. We need a multifactorial approach. And you have heard about the STENO2 trial. However, I brought to you a very important epidemiological um, study in Sweden, they have a state-run registry and they had about 500,000 people with type 2 diabetes matched to 500,000 people without diabetes. And then they were looking at the people with diabetes, whether they had the risk factors controlled, like HbA1c below 7, blood pressure below 140, no albuminuria, no smoking and LDL below uh, 2.5 millimolars or 97 milligrams. So when you had all these five factors controlled, you had zero risk factors. But if you had these five factors uncontrolled, you see here, if you have the five factors not controlled, it doesn't matter in which age group you are, your risk is terribly increased compared to the people without diabetes. So just the rule of five to make it easy, five uncontrolled risk factors. If you are below 55, your mortality risk is five times higher. Wow. And you see a dose-dependent decrease if the people have less risk factors. And this is the very, very good news. If all these risk factors are controlled, mortality is not increased. That's the good thing. The bad thing, you only find about 10% of the people who have all five controlled. But it tells us on an epidemiological level that all three, blood pressure, lipids and HbA1c, take part one out of five factors. So, again, a very strong hint for the cardiometabolic broad approach. Another thing pops up more and more, this is obesity. And when you look at these data, I think at the very beginning, um, I had to learn this concept of lifetime risk. But it's logical. People are exposed to these risk factors for a long period of time whether we diagnose it or not. <laughs> so, this is a very exciting epidemiological observation. They had 190,000 people observed up to 60 years. And when you look at men with normal weight, overweight and severe obesity, you see what we know that morbidity and mortality goes up in men and in women. Nothing new. But, look at that now. If we take the 30% incidence of events in people with obesity, and we take the 30% incidence of events in people with normal weight, you see that these people get it 15 years later. 15 years later. Or take it the other way around. The others get it 15 years earlier, and we call this EVA, 
early vascular aging. Why? Because we know now, and that is more consolidated in the last couple of years, that in particular the visceral fat tissue leads over the course of time to all kinds of alterations which again over the course all, uh, of time perpetuate themselves and lead to fatty liver, to uh, uh, dyslipidemia, to dysglycemia, to diabetes, to hypertension, to heart attacks and heart failure. So honestly, basically, we might be only at the very end of a long story if we just look at one symptom like glucose. So we have, of course, as we all know, all these multiple risk factors causing vascular damage. Unfortunately, in the past, we had the silo approach. As we just said, ah, a bit elevated hypertension, ah, watch it. And so, you know, we are not really attacking it. But we have learned, if you have all these risk factors, and the more of those risk factors you have, the lower the rate of survival. So it is really relevant whether you have one, two, three, or four risk factors, or in that case, yeah, four risk factors on top of your diabetes, for instance. Just to show you how bad we are, these are recent data. I was lecturing last year a couple of times in India, and last year they had this Indian study to come out and to show that more than 60% did not achieve the HbA1c, more than 50% did not achieve the blood pressure, and more than 60% did not achieve the LDL. So there's room for improvement. And you see that the drugs which have been used, of course, were very low, in particular, unfortunately, the blood pressure lowering drugs, drugs and the lipid lowering drugs in people with diabetes. Because the people with diabetes, of course, they focus on glucose first. So, whoops, where are we now? Well, while early on we thought the lower the better would be enough, we then get, got the shocking uh, results of the ACCORD trial. You remember, it had to be stopped because in the more intensified people, 30, uh, arm, 30% 30 of the people died in contrast to what we expected. So at that stage, we said, we want to have good glycemic control, but without the sequelae. We want no hypoglycemia and we want no weight gain. So unless you cannot achieve a good glycemic control without these side effects, you better leave the HbA1c a little bit higher. But that was at a stage when we started to have big hopes for the new components be, which were not showing hypoglycemia, which were even able to reduce the body weight, when the FDA required that we had to do the safety studies. You remember rosy glitazone was accused of killing people? And it has been all drawn back. It's completely rehabilitated. It was between us, Steve Nissen's fight against the company. So what happened at that stage is that FDA was accused of not doing the job. And that's why they required any drug available in the States had to do cardiovascular safety studies. And this is why we got this bunch of studies and I myself participated in most of these trials as a clinical uh, researcher, not as a, <laughs> as a patient. <laughs> so this is the first time that in diabetes we got randomized controlled trials with placebo control, in particular in very high-risk patients. And I remember, um, I'm so old, that I have attended UKPDS and all these presentations we were just talking about. And I remember that when we, when we got the first results of the DPP-4 inhibitors, we had expected that they were doing better and they were neutral. We were very disappointed. But then when you looked into the methodology of these studies, 
They were not designed to find superiority. And it's a totally different type of study as we are used with the statins, with the ACE inhibitors and so on. It was said by FDA, it was only to prove that there was not an unacceptable increased risk. I, I, at that time I thought, hey, if a medication comes to the market, that should have been checked before. <laughs> but um, you need long-term studies. So while we were getting depressed, all of a sudden we got these great news. And uh, for those who had um, the chance to go to uh, Stockholm in 2015, I still get goose bubbles because all of a sudden we had a study, Emparec, to show that there was a reduction in mortality. And then we had a lot of further studies to show that indeed there is a reduction of cardiovascular events, mortality, hospitalization for heart failure. In all these studies, looking at high-risk patients with SGLT2 and GLP-1. And when we ask ourselves, how can this happen? This is a very early slide, but now, basically, you can put all the trials with GLP-1 to the leader trial and all the slides with SGLT2 over to the left, because you see that the GLP-1 takes about 18 months to deviate the curve significantly. In the SGLT2 inhibitors, some of the studies after 10 days already have a difference. So this is far too early for any morphological changes, and that's why we say this is functional change. And over there, it's more like a change in atherosclerotic procedures, because we also see that you get a reduction in atherosclerotic processes like stroke and MI with GLP-1, and we get a very impressive reduction of heart failure and uh, kidney disease in people with SGLT2. And you know that in some countries, like in ours, for instance, we are now able to prescribe uh, SGLT2 non-diabetics uh, with heart failure and CKD. All that induced a change of paradigm. And I have to cite a French guy who said very early on, if we meet a fact which doesn't fit to the prevailing theory, and I would add on, if we have more and more facts to do so, we must accept the facts and abandon the theory, even if there's still some important key opinion leaders and so on to talk about this stuff. So all of a sudden, there was a major shift. We dropped HbA1c as the main target of our, all our uh, interventions. The main target is, of course, for the patient to reduce cardiorenal events. It's not to have a better lab value. And in order to reduce cardiorenal events, we need to have a strict blood pressure control, we have a strict LDL control, and a control of glycemia with agents with a proven safety and efficacy. And this has been reendorsed by the guidelines, uh, the cardiologists, the endocrinologists, and so on. So we move away from sugarology to end organ protection. And this has been reinforced last year, uh, two years ago and last year again, by the EASD-ADA consensus. Well, they said for a long time we were just focusing on that because we wanted to improve glycemia. But we realized if we want to reduce cardiorenal events, we have to also tackle all the other issues because in concert with hyperglycemia, they really aggravate all the cardiorenal disease. Therefore, now another change in paradigm. We still, of course, aim for a good glycemic management. However, and I think this is the revolution, at the same level, it's the control of weight. At the same level, it's the control of cardiorenal risk factors. And at the same level, it's the prescription of drugs which have improved cardiorenal outcome, independent on HbA1c. So I think this is a very important revolution, telling us that we need the four pillars, 
if we want to improve the outcome of our people. And that's one of the reasons why we are here, because you're going to hear later on about hypertension management, you hear about lipid management, because we have the tools. And actually, most of the tools are generic and they are affordable. Yet, we have to focus on bringing these to the patients. Where could we be? Well, we all know it's a lifestyle, a lifestyle disease. So we should take time and I showed, I just put that in um, because we need education, but education requires time and money and so on. In Germany, this is the largest German healthcare provider, we put up a, an app for the patient with uh, different specialists and I was the scientific leader and we have a lot of little videos to explain to the patient why certain things are very important they have to observe in their lifestyle. Because I think education is the key. And as long as we are not telling the people that this is not only the sugar which kills you, we need to observe. People eat a lot of, let's say, they think if they stay off the sweet stuff, everything will be cool. Because sugar is sweet, and if it's not sweet, it can't make an uh, increase in glucose. I mean, the German likes pretzels. And pretzel is great because it's salty. I can eat it. But if they see how much glucose goes up, they are shocked. Well, you know what they do? They put butter on. Because then it decreases the increase in glucose, which is not good for the obesity. Ah. <laughs> okay, so we have to detect it early enough. And I think, who of you is measuring the waist circumference in your patients? You don't have to put the hands up because most of the people are not doing it. When I approach a patient with my band, they say, what the heck would you want to do? In some patients, you don't get around. <laughs> I tell them, hold on and turn around and then you can measure it. <laughs> okay. Of course, it would be easy if we could get rid of the problem. It's the abdominal obesity. If we get rid of it, if it was so easy, we wouldn't be sitting here. However, there is one important thing we have to tell our patients. Liposuction doesn't help. There was an excellent paper in the New England Journal of pa uh, Medicine where they had pe uh, women to have liposuction of 12 gra uh, kilograms of fat. No change in any of the cardiometabolic parameters because it's the wrong fat. So another thing you can take to your patients tomorrow there is this wrong dogma that the beta cell dies. That's not the case. Look at that. 14 years of history of diabetes. And they were looking at people who had a big dinner and a small breakfast. And the next week they had a small dinner and a big breakfast. And then they had the standard lunch and that was the experimental condition. So the same people came in to the lab and they had a big dinner or a small dinner and then a big lunch, uh, a, a, a small breakfast or a big breakfast. Look at the glucose excursions. When you had the big dinner, these are the open circles here, you see that as you had a small breakfast, there's not much here, but at lunch, look at that, much, much, much higher glucose levels. And even in the evening, much, much higher glucose levels, despite the fact that the dinner was the night before. And when you look at the difference, it's amazing. It's the same people. There was no medication given. It was just the switch of a late dinner to a, a big dinner to a small dinner. And look at the insulin. And I think this is the most remarkable to me because I have been doing research in that field for a long time. If you look at those with a big dinner in the evening, let's move over here, you see they have the characteristic disturbance of insulin secretion. They take a long time to come up, very small insulin, you see it much better at the lunchtime, a delayed insulin response. Okay? But the same people having had a, a small dinner, hey, they look like healthy people. There is a dramatic qualitative change in the insulin secretion. Meaning, especially in your culture, if you have very late dinner 
and very late baklava and all that stuff. Horrible. Horrible. You pay for that with a higher HbA1c and with one or two more additional uh, hypoglycemic agents. It's something we can tell our patients. The next thing is we need to check the nutritional protocol. We have to measure physical activity. We have to every once in a while have the patient do blood glucose uh, self-measurement but in a structured way. And we have to make sure that the people take the tablets at the right time. I show you a couple of examples. First of all, this is a guy which opened my mind. Um, it, he came to me, sent from his uh, GP for initiation of insulin therapy. This was 2012. At that time, we believed HbA1c of 8.4. In order to achieve an HbA1c below 7, 1.4% of reduction of HbA1c you cannot achieve with the oral agent, so let's better go for insulin. So the guy had come to me and has never, ever, never, ever done a structured blood glucose profile. So I told him to do this. And in my practice, you will see we have a form. The patient always has to do a fasting, two-hour postprandial, uh, uh, then at lunch, before and after lunch. And look at the data here. So this is the fasting glucose. And I, I ask you to take a couple of seconds to look at it. What is remarkable? It's too high. Yeah. It's awful, isn't it? But when does the trouble start? Huh? Yeah, but the fasting... You're right, but the, it starts over here. Look at that. Yeah, that guy. Let, let's walk out with this. The guy starts up with far too high, but the breakfast induces an amplitude of 60 milligrams. So if he were to start with 100, he would be perfectly okay. And he, for lunch, is back at the same level. So his beta cell function is okay. But he starts out too high. Let's go for the post brandle here. It's, it's 60, 50 again. And then he goes back to normal. And here, all of a sudden, he starts to go up. What happened? The guy told me, you know, doctor, uh, in the last five years, I started to eat two apples a day at 21 p.m., at 9 p.m., because an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And I wanted to be sure, and I eat two. <laughs> and I said, oh, you're stupid. You're going to be r racing towards the doctors like that. And I told him to do two things. And, I, and actually, I, tell you, I show you the, slide, the, the following days. It was remarkable. I told him to take the metformin in the evening as metformin. Because if we take metformin at 8 o'clock, it weans off at 2 o'clock in the morning, unless you have the XR formulation, and we don't have it in Europe. When is gluconeogenesis the highest? Between 2 and 4. So if you just shift that, the same dose, to a later intake, you get a much better fasting glucose. Look at the data of this guy. This is 2012. The very next day, without the apples in the evening, look at the blood glucose. Look at the glucose here. And the whole day was all of a sudden terribly well. And the next couple of days, he continued to measure it. And now he looked like a non-diabetic. Isn't that amazing? I never did prescribe anything else for this guy at that moment. He was just stopping to eat the late sugar. He was taking bedformin. And honestly, I know this guy now for more than 12, year, 12 years. He is just now, a year ago, we had to add on an SGLT2 inhibitor. And he was stable over the course of time. I told him to eat the apples as a dessert for lunch. Because during the, uh, the day, in the afternoon, he can work it, walk it off <laughs> and better uh, manage it. And just for you to tell you the pathophysiology behind. We all produce during the night insulin which are put in vesicle 
for the next day. And if we go to bed with a fasting glucose above 200, our body needs to produce insulin or use the insulin to uh, clear the glucose. So if we are able to really reduce the glucose in the night with metformin, for instance, you get a much better fasting glucose and a better insulin secretion. So it's worthwhile when I do patient cases in Germany, no single doctor ever asked for a nutritional protocol. No doctor even asked for glucose protocol. They just prescribed something. And in that case, you would have prescribed clargin probably, and you would have goofed him up with 40 units of clargin without any improvement. And we would blame the patient to say, oh, the stupid patient doesn't behave. <clears throat> okay, let's just have a couple of examples. This is the same guy with different glucose profiles. And what was the difference? Here he was doing the snacking. He ate between the two meals. And when I told him to stop doing this, glucose profiles were much better. Because he starts to accumulate his glucose over the day. So it's really, and I know that in your culture, snacking berries, snacking sweet stuff, that's no eating. <laughs> Uh, at least in Dubai and the area there. This is, of course, the luxury of having CGM. And I have my patients who are not on insulin, they are not being reimbursed for the CGM, they buy that chip. I have the devices for reading, and all they need to pay, it's about 80 uh, euros for two weeks. It's a lot but it gives you a lot of information. Look at this chap here. He has a tremendous increase in glucose only at breakfast. During the rest of the day, the amplitude is not really very high. So I asked the guy, what do you have for breakfast? Or every time the same thing. What? I eat muesli. Oh, that sounds to be good. And I asked him, what's in there? Oh, a bit of berries, a bit of pears and apples and so on. But then I said, that wouldn't really cause such a dramatic increase. So why don't you decrease the berries and do a glucose profile the next day without your fruits? And look at that. Much, much better. Why? He confessed that over here he had an apple, an orange, a pear, and berries and everything in there. So it was berry, a fruit with a little bit of uh, oat. So doing this, he normalized his glucose profile. The next thing here, <laughs> the right timing of the medication. Another mistake many of my patients do. I couldn't understand why this guy was having such a surge of fasting glucose in the morning. Uh, and later on the day, he was eating his main meals. He was doing fine. What happened? He took the medication after breakfast. So <laughs> I told him, hey, God, you've got to do that before you start to eat. And look at the next day. That's the next day already. Much better. And then last thing, which I like to recommend to my patients, because it doesn't cost anything. These are people with a long history of diabetes who came in and they had first the carbs, and then the salad, and then a steak, protein. The next two weeks, they came and had salad first, with or without the steak, and then the carbs at the very end. Look at that. This is carbs first, and this is salad first. They have eaten the same stuff. So they didn't have to give up anything, no diet, but they were just eating it in the right order. Isn't that amazing? Because when you, yeah, oops, <laughs> when you have your salad first, um, the carbs come into the mixture of all the fibers and it's being reabsorbed in a much slower fashion, also reflected by a much lower need for insulin. It's quite a lot. And my patients like it because they can eat what they did, but just in the right order. 
The only thing is, I don't know, in your countries, most of the Germans, they don't like to prepare salad or veggies, and they write salad, and I have them now take pictures with their cell phones, and sometimes you're surprised. Oh, I had spaghetti with salad. And you looked at the picture, it was spaghetti, cheese, and two leaves of salad. So sometimes it's worthwhile to have a look. The other thing is, tell your patients to walk. This is a very old study, but I like it. They told the people to walk, and look at that. You see in green all these risk factors, actually they are in German, I'm sorry, um, improved significantly with 50, 45 minutes of walking. These up there whoops, were the couch potatoes, and they were walking 12 hours a week. But just 45 minutes of walking, not jogging, was enough to improve everything. I think that's very important. And yesterday when I arrived, I was shocked. Look around, they've got a bus stop here for this thing. And of course, the wrong people, it's for dis disabled people to go. But look at the people who, try, who, who, who talk, take a ride. That's amazing, isn't it? We are stupid. I was at the airport yesterday in Zurich when I come here. Is anyone on the picture? <laughs> Let's just move on. <laughs> um, I like to walk, and they have these travelators. People stand there. It's just horrible. And the pace the people walk, it has come down. It's just amazing. Yeah, because you have to carry so many pounds. Okay. One thing which is also easy for our patients is the 5S. It's Interrupt your sitting, because the sitting is the new smoking, and we know that people who interrupt the sitting while they are working have a drop of HbA1c of 0.5%. At least once a day you need to do some sweating, not the sauna, but some sweating by exercise, some strengthening, um, some stepping, use the stairs, not the elevator, and improve your sleep in quantity, because many of the young people sleep far too, uh, not enough, and um, the sleep quality, because many of the obese people have obstructive sleep apnea, for instance, which uh, is also a major contributor for hypertension, for lousy metabolic control. So, and if we look at what we are targeting at, according to the new uh, paradigm, of course all antihyperglycemics are, a <laughs> are aiming to reduce glycemia. But if we come to the weight, there are a couple of them which are weight neutral, but others even help to improve weight. If we look at the cardiovascular risk factors, you see some of them are improved, some of them um, are not changed, and you know that some of them have improved the outcome. So there is more selection criteria. So what is a good partner? While in the past we were just looking for here, we are now aiming to at least observe the other risk factors. And you see some of the drugs which we have are not as good in these people, while others are doing better because they improve the outcome. So altogether, in order, after we have done our homework in looking at the lifestyle, the medication and all that stuff, if we select the drug, we should look into the mode of action. If you have a postprandial problem, of course an SU is better than an SGLT2 because you have to improve insulin secretion during a postprandial period. But if you have an increase in the fasting glucose, maybe an SGLT2 inhibitor could be better and all that stuff. So now, in the last couple of years, there had been a tremendous success. While earlier we just wanted to get no uh, hyperglycemia um, and no weight gain, now we aim to have cardiovascular safety and on top of that now cardiovascular superiority. You won't be able to get any new drug unless you can improve the outcome. I'm currently involved in a trial which you might have heard of, the twin cretines, which is GLP-1 and GYP. Monjaro is the brand name in Europe. 
This is the first cardiovascular outcome trial which was for ethical reasons not able to have a placebo group. Because the ethical committee says it is not ethical to have a group of high-risk patients not to be treated with a GLP-1 receptor agonist. So in that study, which will be tough, we have dulaglutide, which already showed to improve outcome, versus uh, Monjaro. And we will see what's coming up. So what about the injectables? And the ADA says, OK, they, if money doesn't play a role, of course, a GLP-1 should be the first injectable. And then, according to where the problem is, you should add in further, add in further medications. In Europe, and in particular in Germany, they frequently stopped everything and they went on insulin only, which is not right, because you all know that metformin uh, does the job all the time. And there has been also a shift because of the data. Many studies have been done to show that GLP-1 is superior to basal insulin. People have not only a better HbA1c, but they have a better BMI, blood pressure, and lower rates of hypoglycemia. So that's one of the reasons why they say that GLP-1 should be the first injectable before basal insulin. And they add on that um, you should, uh, as we said, you should always add it on um, to the existing therapy and the treatment intensification should not be de delayed. So there is a question about what are the advantages of uh, analog insulins. There are some lab values which indicate it's a slightly faster reduction of glycemia a slightly lower risk of hypoglycemia, but so far there's no hint for any better outcome. And we are treating people and we want to reduce the complications. So while on, let's say, the marketing, analog insulins look very good, um, I think the most important issue for us is that we should not delay the improvement of metabolic control, that is the most important. And if you have uh, human insulin and a good human insulin available, just go for it. But the important I issue with all this is we need education for the patient. Affordability is an issue. Just with education, one thing. If you do a blood glucose profile, for time reasons I didn't show that, you find some patients who have just one single meal which goofs up the glucose. And when you supply insulin at only that meal, you might be able to have one supplementation of insulin treatment at that one particular meal and keep all the other agents in, you will be much better. That's why blood glucose self-monitoring, but in a structured way, is relevant. We did a PhD in Germany. People are, get re are being reimbursed for the test strips if they are on insulin. However, 60% of the doctors never look at the glucose values. How can you modify treatment in an intelligent way if you don't look at it? And use as low doses as possible because we have the other agents which should be continued. And the other thing is to do follow up and speak to the patients because we did talk, briefly mention the defensive snacking and all that stuff um, because sometimes you're very much surprised that the patient himself reduces the insulin dose and you, th you think that can't be true because you have augmented the insulin dose but the patient reduced it because of some fear of hypoglycemia or whatsoever. So at the very end I want to tell you a little glimpse into the future. While in the past we have been considering the patient only at risk when we had a vascular burden, the diabetologist popped up here couple of years later, the, the diabetologist, the cardiologist popped up and at the very end we had the nephrologist. Well, the only guy who sees the patient all the time is the consulting physician. In the future we need to move up because we know that very early on we should already intervene. We should have, and you see here, diabetologist and metabologist because in Germany the doctors only consider someone at risk when he has an HbA1c. 
but we know that the pre-diabetes phase already is associated with an increased cardiorenal risk. So we have the metabologist, we have the cardiologist and the nephrologist, and soon also the hepatologist to get involved with the mash, with the fatty liver. What is going to happen in the future? In the United States, Bob Ecker, down here, I know him, very nice guy, he is the only um, specialist who had been the president of American Heart, of American Diabetes, and the American Obesity Society. So he is setting up a new specialty. It's the cardiometabolic specialist who has three years of cardiovascular training and three years of internal training and endocrinology. We are trying to do this in Europe. It's quite more uh, difficult. Uh, we have too many countries and too many <laughs> administrators. So we try to have a subspecialty. And we already had last year a big meeting in London. And we have the next meeting just at the beginning of May, uh, together with the European Society of Cardiology, where we have a four-day meeting where we work on the cardiometabolic medicine, because this is the way we need to go in the future. We have the cardiometabolic patient. We have the GP taking care of him, but we should have the metabologist, the cardiologist, and the nephrologist who are being supported by the specialist who knows evidence-based medicine, who tells you this is the best intervention for this patient and this is the better intervention for that patient. And we will have to add on the other specialties every once in a while. And as I mentioned, the gastroenterologist is, I think, uh, someone who needs to pop in soon because we in the last two years of the conferences we learned that the ectopic fat and the fatty liver and also if you can measure it the liver the the fat in the pancreas they are the evils i have done my research and if you look it up in pubmed um, i was one of the ones who discovered the ectopic fat in the muscles the intramyocellular lipid which is closely associated with insulin resistance the studies clearly show if you are able to reduce the intrapancreatic fat, beta cell functions is normal. Diabetes can be cured. Very exciting data. So we need to go in this direction. So the take home message is, as we discussed, that is a malignant disease. Uh, we have a lot of risk factors and we learned that just bashing glucose and HbA1c is not good enough. We need the multifactorial approach. We also need to put a little bit more attention to the lifestyle modifications and support our patients. Uh, we need to take time to explain. We have good data for SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, which really are able to improve the outcome in high-risk patients. And the most important thing is for us to overcome inertia for the risk factor detection for the risk factor management, and for the use of the right agents. So don't wait till the complications are there. Start to treat as early as possible, and the best thing is to prevent it, because if you have the family, if you have the patient there, look at the family, because you have a very high risk in that family. So I want to close out. If we always do what we always did, we shouldn't be surprised that we always get what we always got because no improvement. So all the no new knowledge needs to be transported to our patient and it's only then that life expectancy and quality of life can get better. With this, I show you the Alps yesterday on my flight. It looked very nice. This is where I live. No, this is not my house. This is around the corner. I live in the Black Forest, which looks like a white forest now. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, this year we didn't have too much snow. It looks more like that here. It's uh, an awful winter this year. Uh, the climate change had arrived also in the Black Forest. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Jacob.